back to this transition of being a founder to CEO, all of a sudden you're responsible for so much more than you had ever imagined. Ignition sequence start. Three, two, one. Michael Litt, what's up, dude? I am very happy to be here, Dan. Dude, I appreciate you, man. You're one of my good buds. Thank uh, you. We do a ski trip every year. It's, um, I mean, is this five years for you? I've been doing it for seven. I think this will be five. Yeah. Yeah, if not. The first year we got canceled. Yeah, I still consider it because there was still stuff. Like, you you hung out with Craig went and you guys Rebel went Stoke. in. Yeah, yeah, we actually turned around and on the flights. And we ended up buying one of the companies of the guys that was oh, there. Oh, that was crazy. I mean, that's what people are like. So, so like, is this a business thing? Or I said, first and foremost, <clears throat> it's my vacation. So don't F with it. Um, fuck. Why am I saying F with it? It's my podcast. <laughs> yeah, uh, say whatever it's you my want. vacation. So don't fuck with it. Uh, and then B, a lot of stuff happens just through conversations. Like you ended up acquiring a company. Um, you're the founder of Vidyard, an incredible company. I'm a customer. My dad's a customer, Victor, which is awesome. One of the originals. Um, doesn't pay you a lot, so sorry for the low ACV on that one. It's okay. Uh, and you've built the, what's the Garage Ventures? Garage Capital. Garage Capital. So you've invested in how many companies through that? Uh, just over 80. 80 and companies. 40 million in, AUM. And how long have you been deploying capital through that? Six years. Okay, but you're an entrepreneur, man. You're a creator. We met yep. when you were at YC, geez, almost probably a decade ago now. Is uh, it 2009? 2011. Oh, okay, 11. Okay, cool. Uh, so not not a decade yet, but um, always enjoyed our conversation. You're funny, yet you can go deep on the business side of things, which I find awesome. Um, what are, like... So one of the things I want to talk to you about is the freemium play you guys just pulled off at Vidyard or, yep. or going through. Most companies move up market, and in, in some ways you come down. How did you think about it? What's what's the rationale? What's been the impact so far? Yeah, for sure. So there's a number of factors that come into play with this decision. One is, and I think the easiest one to describe with respect to data, is the sheer number of companies in the MarTech landscape today. Yeah. The barrier to entry to developing... Do you have, Technology is there like 50,000 MarTech companies? 7,000. There's 7,000. But when we started, it was 150. Wow. Period, right? So when we started the company, you know, you'd call into a CMO or a VP of sales, say, hey, I've got a solution to this problem you don't know you have. Are you interested? Yeah. And that's how we grew. Yep. I did. To, and just to talk about that, the early early days, because I think it'll be useful to your audience, um, we built a crawler called DMOS. Nostradamus, yeah. called the DMOS. I've already talked about this with you potentially. Dude, we talk. I mean, yeah, we did, yeah. I think we did a co-presentation last year. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. you know yeah, the yeah, story, yeah. right? It's and, awesome. Though, yeah. And um, and and came and you up were with like a lead calling. List. You were doing it. Yeah, yeah, hand-to-hand so -hand combat. Hundred contacts a day. Um, that would be developed while I slept. I'd wake up, look at these hundred contacts, go do calls, take the customer feedback, give that to the engineers. They'd wake up, build the code through the night. We'd sync up in the morning. They'd tell me what they built, and I'd go out and call those people back and try to sell to them. And that was kind of the Victor era. Yeah. Um, another one of our first customers was Donna, who I ended up marrying. Yeah, yeah. We take customer success very seriously. Very seriously. Yeah. Uh, and so, anyways, that's the way we did things, right? Now, 7,000 companies doing the same thing doesn't necessarily work anymore, yeah. right? And hey, when did you, you have see that, is that like, was, I mean... I don't know what you're comfortable sharing on, on numbers, but did you see kind of like this this uh, this like growth ceiling coming? Yeah, like we just knew like that things are getting more expensive, CAC's getting more expensive, or yeah, CAC yeah. CAC increases for sure. Yeah. Um, response we, rates are lowering, or yeah, response rates to cold outbound are lowering. There's there's certain headwinds that you yeah. just kind of organically yeah, start to feel scale. right. Yeah, and it wasn't it wasn't limiting growth of the company because you can always, in our case, venture back, spend more yeah. money to acquire those customers, be yeah. in more places, and yeah. in a lot of ways, we got a head start. Yeah, and so we already had brand recognition. How much did you guys raise so far? Is it forty? Uh, Sixty five. Sixty five. Okay. Yeah, U.S. Um, so, anyways, so so this is happening, right? And 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 I think when you have a landscape that's commoditized, aka there's a lot of options. You know, the biggest execution risk for an employee in a company is time. And so how do you help them preserve that time in a commoditized landscape? The only option, in my opinion, is to have a free product, right? It just makes a ton of sense. That way they don't have to schedule demos. And, yeah. yeah. So like I'm a marketer and I need to put a video on a landing page or send mm -hmm. a video in an email or yeah. I'm, I'm a sales rep and I want to send a video to a prospect. 
I'm not going to go through a week and a half long discovery process and talk to someone in sales and then go back to my company and ask for a budget and run a 60, 90 days cycle of yeah. research and effort to go and solve this problem I have. I'm going to go find the best available option for free. And the reality is in our market, specifically for hosting video, putting in a landing page, et cetera, the status quo vendor is, is YouTube, which is free. Mm -hmm. And so it just became very, very obvious to us based on all these dynamics that we were seeing that a free option was the best way but to break into But did you learn that? Like you had, uh, most, it's funny, it's not long ago, but most people know you knew, viewed it, right? So I feel like an OG because yeah. I knew viewed it. And then, and then you're like, no, we renamed it to Go Video. And then yesterday I heard you say, no, it's just Vidyard. Yeah. It's like... So it was that because that was kind of a freemium kind of, I call it, you know, uh, app, you know, an expensive lead gen tool, but yeah. 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 So, so we had, we kind of had appetizers to this main course of full yeah. freemium and that, uh, yes, the Chrome extension was free. That was um, the viewed it, go yeah, video it initially slash go video. video now. Now. Just yeah. Um, 650,000 users on yeah, it that crazy. we were able and to mine yeah. for upsell and enterprise accounts yeah. on a seat Especially basis. Build pipeline. Yeah. And then HubSpot came along and said, hey, we want to offer a video product. And we gave them access to our APIs. They built HubSpot video on top of us. Yeah. It's not white labeled. It's HubSpot video powered by Vidyard. It's yeah. in Sales Hub, Marketing Hub, Service Hub. A year later, we've got 25,000 shared organizations using HubSpot video. It's and a multi-million dollar. And if they buy, it's on your, yeah. your, it's your deal. It's a multi-million dollar business line Inside for us. their, wow, inside yeah. their platform. Inside their platform. Super rare, They run right? frontline support, super, super rare. Like like I can't our, think of many. Our board was like, we've never seen a deal like this before. This yeah. is pretty interesting. But for HubSpot, it, you know, it took away the execution Buy risk is, yeah. of building the product. They validated that our product was was best in market based on the customers we have. That's cool. And we were willing to support it with a free model where we collected all the upside. Um, you know, there's going to be a phase two and a phase three of that relationship, yeah. um, which I'm really excited about. But uh, it was kind of this real appetizer to free. Brian Halligan. Amazing entrepreneur, CEO. Hopefully you get him on the podcast one day if you haven't already. I'd love to, yeah. Yeah, we should ask him. Um, you know, he, he did this really interesting thing at, at Inbound, um, which I loved, where he talked about the buying cycle for executives. And there was 30 people in the room. And he said, raise your hand if you've made a software purchasing decision in the last year. And these were CMOs, uh, CROs, CEOs. Yeah, C Not one person Shut raised up. their hand. Not one person. Oh, shit, because it's coming from the bottom up. Yeah. Oh, right. Execution Dude, risk. I would have put money time. on that. I would have lost all my money. Yeah. I but previous five years, everybody was involved. Yeah. Right. So this thing has changed. Think about Slack, right? Slack yeah. gives you Dude, 95%. I heard Slack salespeople for a certain segment SMB don't even have quota. Yeah. Like the things are shifting. Things are shifting massively, right? Yeah. The consumer has all the purchasing power. Yeah. And it's not the CMO. It's the user. And that purchasing power is their time. And time is the most expensive economy. That's a good argument, man. In today's world, yeah. So I don't know if I would have. I, I'm. I wasn't a freemium fan. Neither was I. I'm I mean, like, I'm like, pay me. Yes, but I here's, create, here's yeah. the thing, right? My life has been full of companies. I mean, I got my career start at BlackBerry, that just didn't read the tea leaves. Yeah, and so here I am reading the tea leaves, saying we want to be a five, ten, fifteen, twenty year old business. How are we going to ensure that yeah. we keep up with the times, yeah. maintain our competitive advantage, and continuously innovate, by getting as many people as possible to use our product? I right. don't disagree that it is a powerful engine and moat because I mean you look at Mailchimp and like many others. Yep, um, it's just a very courageous decision at your scale. I think yeah. to make as a venture back company. Like, did your board push back on you? Did did your internal team like? I mean, this is, this is some serious buy-in. The internal dynamic shift is an interesting one. Um, the board one is actually easier. So the board, you know, we've been very fortunate. Um, we've got a, a very Dieter. eclectic board, Byron yeah. Dieter, 11, yeah. 12, I don't know, maybe 15 cloud IPOs at this point. Yeah. Shannon Brayton, CMO yeah. of LinkedIn, yeah. premiums their motion. Uh, Michael Brown from Battery Ventures, uh, he's seen it is all before. Is that who we hung out with, Michael Brown in Dublin? Last year. Yeah. 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 yeah that I was like Michael that guy. Brown. Downtown Michael Brown. <laughs> yeah. He's a great, he's a great human. Cool. Um, Dennis Cavalman was at Blackberry. Yeah. Um, and you know, I think the secret to board management is honestly being honest, open, transparent. Yeah. Um, and letting them know why you're doing what you're doing and justifying it with data yeah, yeah. and experience. And, yeah. and they just you know, want to know that you, you're looking at things to make those decisions. Yeah. They trust us to do the right things. Yeah. Right. And, and, and so the bigger issue though is the team. 
because you know I use the same arguments that I, I just communicated with you to tell the team that hey this is what we need to do yeah the, and the, they're all like yeah that makes sense it's great and then they go back to their job doing yeah, the exact I got this same thing, thing that I built that I doing. yeah these yeah right you gotta drums. protect the base yeah while you completely change the way you're gonna add to that base yeah everything changes everything changes I mean you're ta- you're messing with people's like if sales sales guy it's like what how's comps gonna how's you know yeah. Everything. So believe it or not, the 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 one thing that hasn't really changed, and it will over time, is sales. Okay. The biggest changes happen in product yep. and marketing, and yep. that now all of a sudden they have to work together. Mm. And in an enterprise business, product and marketing don't nope. really collaborate ever. Just give me an SLA, I'll meet it. Don't talk to me. Exactly. And now, product is is held just as accountable for user growth and user adoption as marketing is. That's a big shift. Big shift. Big shift. And no longer is the engineering team just focused on code base and code code quality and the microservices. They're now aligned to the customer funnel. So we have a product manager and a designer and an engineering manager aligned to free, Mm -hmm. aligned to pro, aligned to the business. Because free has to be managed like a product. It has to be good. It has to, for it to do the thing it's supposed to do, it has to like the pro- the free product has to be a product like can't be a, a watered down version like nope. it's got to add value um, quickly. The risk I would see and I've talked to founders is like giving away too much. Like, did you guys do a histogram analysis? How did you guys figure out where the free line was going to be? Yeah, so we have a lot of data to identify what people are willing to pay for at the enterprise level and at kind of the pro level, right? Mm-hmm. And again, a lot of people I think think that freemium is a motion that works for SMBs. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of data to show that freemium is actually a motion that drives a ton of penetration in the enterprise as well. Mm-hmm. But just so happens to be a motion that lets you sell Is that a to, new thing? Is that like a new Slack Dropbox thing? Or is that... Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah, Atlassian, yeah, I no, they, they didn't have free Atlassian, did they? Oh, yeah. Did they? Okay. I just knew that you could buy everything as like three grand credit card. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the free trial was the original kind of freemium yeah. motion, right? Yeah. In enterprise. Um, and so what this does is allow us to sell to small companies who just want to buy on a credit card and not to talk to someone in sales. Closer. Not talk to someone in sales. How about this? This is good now. That, that works good. Okay. Yeah, Mike's, Mike's good. Who else, who else did Audio. this? Audio. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to I don't get any weird germs from this, <laughs> no, from you're this fine. mic. Okay. No, we'll just send you a here. bunch of photos of people uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's close talking. Yes. Yeah, like yeah, this we, is, we wipe these down. We basically made out with all these people yeah, on, yeah. on Dan Martell's yeah, I'll podcast. send you faces. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that's going to haunt me. Um, but yeah, so it's not just about small business success, right? It's also about enterprise and penetrating that enterprise in multiple ways, right? So, that, so the ideal motion now is that someone needs to put a video on a landing page. So they Google that, they upload the video to Vidyar, they embed it in their landing page, that's great. Someone in the sales team starts using our Chrome extension or um, someone in the BDR team uses the 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 um, video creation tool, screen recording, webcam yep. recording tool in Sales yep. Loft or yep. Outreach or HubSpot. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, we have this diverse subset of users in a company. And the concern that an enterprise has about that diverse subset of users is, A, what content are they sharing? B, if they're using the free product, it's on a Vidyard branding sh- branded sharing page. It's not yep. on our branded sharing page, which yep. is our header and our footer and draws more, more navigation. Yep. Um, there's no shared content library. Yep. There's no no security. There's no, there's no data. Data, right? Who's watching these videos for how long on the contact? So this record. is the l- land and expand model of just getting people to adopt, and then you guys look at that and say like this pattern's showing up at this enterprise company. Let's assign you know different. Is it? And then so you guys launched. Um, you have some data now. Is it promising? Yes, hugely promising. More promising than I would have anticipated. Predicted. Are you serious? Yeah, way better than anticipated. Wow. There was like pent up demand for this that we did not even perceive. So prior, did you guys have a free trial? Nope. Really just a, re- a demo request and then you go. Yeah, in our enterprise motion. The only way you could buy Vidyard prior to the whole Chrome extension world yeah, yeah. was to raise your hand on the website yeah. or we call you and you say, hey, that's interesting. SQL, self-qualified yeah. lead or MQL. Yeah. Now we have the PQL. PQL. Which Talk is, about the PQL. The PQL you is were, the- You were early on this PQL stuff. PQL is the holy grail of the QLs. Yeah. 
Because and this is this is essentially identifying where the opportunities are based on usage, like people actually using the product. Yeah. Product qualified lead. And if I'm a salesperson, I would much rather talk to someone that's using the product and getting value out of it than someone who's just willing to take a call for research purposes. Yeah. Right. And is running an investigation in a competitive process. Yeah. Right. A PQL kind of removes the competitive process. You know They've already made yeah. the decision that we're going to use Vidyard for yeah, something. Yeah, just how much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're going to pay. Yep. How much are you going to pay? Exactly. So amazingly, on our very first day of launch, 2,500 PQLs. What? Yep. Damn. Blew my mind. I wrote an email to the board and I was like, <laughs> hey, if this is the first day. It's really promising. And actually what correlated to that, although that number has persisted since because it's grown, was we got featured in the Chrome store. Mm. And I don't know if that's Google's algorithm. Being now, like, did you change press. the Chrome extension in any way? We did it. We did update. You did add the some copy new on it. And, um, yeah. yeah, a couple new features, new description. The Go Video brand went away. We just yeah. called it Vidyard. The reason we call it Vidyard is because I come to conferences and people are like, I love sending Vidyards. And yeah. they're like, just this, don't is like this is like Kleenex. This is what I'm they not call it. No, no, it's, it's tissue paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Kleenex. Let's yeah. just call it Kleenex. Yeah. Right? And then in regards to um, how you. Cause like my, my thoughts would be like, now you have to set some parameters around when you reach out to these organizations. Like you can't, do you like jump on them right away? They're a PQL or just like, what's the, what's the definition for you guys? Yeah. So our North star as a company now is the monthly active user. Yeah. And the reason we do that is because it's a great way to align product and marketing. Back to that previous point. Yeah. Yeah. So and the for idea you guys, is it's one a week video and viewed. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we have a very strict kind of rule set around what is an MAU. Yeah. A lot of companies are like, hey, they signed up. They they're signed an up. MAU. Yeah. And then you call them, they're like, uh, no I thanks. forgot I signed up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We what want are, them to be you? active, getting value out of it before we have that conversation. So what that does is it drives marketing to boost the volume of people that could PQL and could sign up for the product. And then it forces product to think about providing enough value so that these people actually activate and use it and get value, mm -hmm. which then allows us to have that conversation with them. Yep. Now, our sales team is split into two groups, um, emerging and commercial. Emerging is 200 employees and less. Commercial is 200 employees and more. Mm -hmm. The workflow at which those PQLs go through that team is a work in progress. Yeah. But basically, our BDR team, which is aligned to the commercial team, will call into the base of active users and say, hey, this is what you're missing out on. Are you interested? And then hand that over to a commercial rep. Individually, to the individual usage within an organization. Yeah. Okay. A similar message for a depart regardless of the department those people are part of? It really depends on the size of the organization, right? And again, BDRs are lined to your two buyers employers always like It's like sales enablement or is it also marketing? Because I mean, you guys, yeah. So who are your buyers? Yeah. So number one, there's the video producer inside of an organization, mm -hmm. right? For that's storage. the person that's like, I need, yeah, I need a place to store video. I need the ability to embed it. I want some basic analytics on the performance of my assets. That person has a lot of different names from director of video strategy to video yeah. production, to intern, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of that. That person normally rolls up to a VP of content, VP digital, sometimes CMO, demand generation director is another person involved in that. So in marketing, it's really the whole team, right? Because video is becoming such a core part of the strategy. So someone starts using it and then we have to build consensus with that whole team. So demand gen, for instance, is a checkbox. Does it integrate with Marketo or HubSpot? And can I use it to generate more leads by embedding personalized video and email campaigns? Yeah. Or can I run nurture campaigns based off of how much Which is, is a must watching? today if you're doing outbound. Like you've got to personalize a video. That's, I mean, you guys were known for that. You show people how to do that. And still people don't do it. Yeah. Which is crazy. It's right. amazing how I think, don't take this as any offense marketers that are listening to this podcast, but there's a lot of lazy marketers. Marketing automation is kind of a victim of its own success, right? Yeah. It made it easier to send emails to massive lists and email open rates, you know, Plummeting. Gary Vaynerchuk talks yeah. about his email and the marketers and will the ruin all things. 90% yeah, open, open rate. rates back in the nineties. Yeah. Late nineties, early two thousands. Now we beat 2% yeah, and everybody's I doing the hula pumped. dance, right? Pumped. Yeah. I read you. Oh, for open rates. Uh, yeah, we're, we're rocking about 20% and then it's a uh, 2% on the click throughs. One yes. in 1.8 and 2% yeah. on the click throughs. Um, I appreciate that, man. Yeah. So that's on the marketing side. Yeah. On the sales side, it's sales reps, 
It's directors of sales, sales managers that want to break into new territories, try new things to gather attention. Uh, BDR teams doing outbound prospecting and outbound sales. Uh, sales enablement leads that are trying to describe a new workflow or a new pricing to their team and want feedback if the team is watching it. Uh, product managers who are doing design crits or walking through product roadmaps So pretty much if teams. there's a video aspect to an organization, you guys are going to, you guys play a part there. And here's the thing. There needs to be a video aspect to an organization. Yeah. And that's the scale of our opportunity. And yeah. that's what gets me out of bed every day. Our mission is to help businesses succeed with video. So we that's build your products mission. to help businesses succeed with, with video. video. And in regards to the other headwinds that have come up over the years, what, what, have, what are things that you didn't, you know, what are some other big challenges you've had to kind of overcome over the years? Well, I think Remember you had like a big, didn't you hire, uh, maybe I mean, again, I don't know what I can talk about, but like the VP of sales culture fit problem. Yep. That one. Like what can you, because I mean, that to me is really a lot of founders are like, okay, I'm going to hire this guy. He's going to come, he's going to solve all my problems. And it's not necessarily, can they bring a playbook to execute? It's can they fit the culture? And I know you guys like people, what do you call them? Vidyardians? Yeah. They come in. Do you still do the hand in the oh, yeah. paint? Yeah, I mean, yep. green paint, hand door, on the, wall. the hand on the wall, <laughs> look in the eye. Yeah. This is this is what you're committing to, and don't you ever, you know, forget. I mean, you take culture very seriously. Yes. So I don't know what examples you want to use as, you know, but how should how should founders think about that and, and how that's going to help you or yeah. hurt you? So something that we introduced recently that I wish we'd done from the very beginning of time is what we call the nine box. The nine box is, so I'm an engineer, so I try to use as much data as possible to define these things, but you have an axis which on one, the vertical axis is values, and on the horizontal axis is performance. Mm. And then you, you plot your entire team. So you ask your managers to plot their contributors. You ask the contributors to plot each other. The, the SLT, senior leadership team, yeah. does the managers and each other. The ELT, does themselves and each other. Yeah. And what you end up with is this chart that has the whole team ranked based on their alignment to performance and values. And you divide it up into these nine boxes. So is it like right? a two by two? Well, I guess it's a three by three. Three by three. So top right is golden handcuffs, right? We want to keep you in the organization. The number one thing that keeps high performers in an organization is keeping other high performers in, in the, the organization. organization. They want to work with great people. Bingo. If an A feels like it's carrying a bunch of B's and C's, Burn. they will leave. To go find the reason a why A's. we built this is because an A came to me and said, I'm going to leave because I'm carrying my team. And I said, tell me more, please, what is going on? And I learned that in the process of going from 50 to 200 employees, we took really great individual contributors and made them the managers management. Oof. and never taught them how to a fire. Manage. Oh, or fire manage their team, yep. manage people out. Yep. Everybody just wants to coach. And new managers actually hide weaknesses from senior leadership because they feel like it's their responsibility to bring that person up. Yep. They don't realize I can get rid of that person and put someone in here in that I need. So I don't have to carry them. So this tool set, this that, inbox, Dude, that's huge, man. So huge. You, yeah. Huge. You didn't teach them how to fire. Yes. That is the most important thing to scaling an organization, right? Hiring is relatively easy. Yep. If you have a great culture, you attract really yep. awesome people. Talent pipeline. But not everybody is going to be a great fit. Yep. So on this box, right, top right corner, performance values alignment, golden handcuffs, let's keep that person. Let's make sure we build A's around them. Bottom. They got to go. They got to go immediately, right? Dude, this is what I heard Vista does. Private equity, Vista. Yeah. They... Uh, you know, one of their playbooks is essentially talent scoring and pros file. And they pretty much say the A's, we give them equity, we da da da, da like we make them part of the win. And everybody else, it's, it's, I think it's like A's, we, we give them comp, B's, we coach them up or out, yep. bottom, out. Yep. And like that's like in the first 90 days. Yep. They do this. Yeah. It's crazy. It's, and it's absolutely one of the best things I think an organization can do. And if you build that into your culture from day one, Right, you won't run into this issue. And when you where say all build sudden, into it, is it something you teach? Like, do, does a new employee know that this is going to be done to them? Yeah, okay, they do now. Okay, and a manager once a quarter needs to sit down with that employee and have that discussion on where, where they, they are on that relative chart. to that team. Right, and, and that, that's feedback from their point of view and the team's point of view. So they're getting yeah. three hundred and sixty. Yeah. Ooh. 
It's very, very, I perform, very like valuable. as a type A guy. Like I don't want to be in the bottom lap. I want to be in the top <clears throat> wherever. Yeah. You know, and so top right. So some of the best people say, Hey, this is where I want to be. What do I need to do to get there? Yeah. Right. When I was an intern, interns at the university of Waterloo were rated from, um, below expectations yeah, just through shit. the satisfactory phase to excellent. And then if you're really good, you got an outstanding and outstanding required an extra bit of work by the employer to fill in why you were outstanding and why you went above and beyond. And so I'd go into my work term and say, I'm not a good student. So I need outstandings. If I'm going to have any shot at a decent career, yeah, tell after me what's above and beyond. Yeah. What do I need to do to become an outstanding? Give me the list. Tell me what it is. Yeah. I'm going to do every single one of those Point things. Point me in the direction. And I always got an outstanding, right? So now we have a vehicle to do that in the company, which didn't exist before. Mm. It's talked about. Couple gotchas. Two, if someone is very high values and low performance, that's a coaching opportunity in yep. my opinion, right? Yep. What's going wrong on the performance side? Do they just not have the tools or the skills? Can we invest in that person? Because yep. they bleed the culture. They know what we do. They they love the customer. And that and, and if you had to rank, them. you know, performance over culture, culture has to come first. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You can't have a star player or a high performer that's disruptive and against values and all that Bingo. stuff. And yeah. this is the second gotcha. Back to the original question, right? Yeah. We had a really, really, really high performing individual that was not a good values fit. And the way I discovered this values fit is people were coming around them saying you know, I am questioning everything that is my existence working for this person. And here's the type of stuff that's going on. Peers were saying that stuff as well. And I realized that if I did not move that person on from the business, I was going to have a mass exodus because people just did not want to work with them. And so a high performer with low values is literally what we call cultural cancer and it will rot away at your team. And as a leader, as your company gets bigger and bigger, it's harder and harder for you to see that unless you build trust and people come to you and you do something about it. And so this is a vehicle for me to get perspective of if that exists and how to eradicate it in the process. It's perspective because they're going to show up right yeah. there and then you got to figure out is this, can we work with them on the value side? Yeah, and I would say... Performance is coachable because you can tell somebody how to do something and work them through that process. But yeah. values are kind of integrated. They're locked into in. Who like you once are. you're like 25, I feel like I heard this somewhere, or I heard like once, like by the age of 30, your music preference is pretty much locked and loaded. Like most people don't change. Most people, yeah. I know, we're very open-minded entrepreneurs. We're we'll discover them, cool at different things. But like for most human beings, at 30, you're locked and loaded. I think it's like pretty much like 25. Like I've heard seven. Really? Yeah. Well, no, in the, in the kid side, you I know boys, my, my right? wife, yeah. Renee, said that to us. She's like, you know, <laughs> the, we all have to be really, really good for seven years because that's going to, you know, so I was like, thank <laughs> goodness because I can't keep this up. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Like that. Yeah, no, seven. So that's fair. So if, if people are, you know, but the, so prior to that, you guys must have done some kind of like career path development, but it just didn't incorporate this. Yes. We don't always ask people what they want to do and where yeah. they want to go and try to align them to that path. Right. Yeah. And that's a great thing that needs to be a part of this as well. But the problem with that is, is career development and path development doesn't necessarily align always to, to, to the corporate objectives of the company. Right. Yeah. If somebody wants to be a CEO, Right. While I'm sitting in this role, there's not really a clear path to that, but mm -hmm. I can give them access to the stuff CEOs would do that I am learning and the stuff yeah. I'm doing, right? The biggest learning for me on being a CEO is that as a founder, you're the person who's really good at starting shit. CEOs are the person who's really good at scaling it, mm -hmm. right? That's the biggest difference. And yeah. applying these types of things like the nine box to ensure the company is performing and amplifying their efforts through all the people that they've brought into the organization, right? So yeah. through that, we've had a number of entrepreneurs that have now spun off their own companies yeah. that we've worked with and helped do that, that we funded through Garage Capital, right? Mm -hmm. So the Vidyard Mafia starts to get developed through this process of, yeah. of helping people get better and, and, and plan because to Because you know their values, the you've seen them operate over time. So that's whole performance over time thing. Yeah. Like yeah. I love the people I work with. Yeah. I honestly can say that. And I love seeing them progress and develop and do the things they want. So just because they leave doesn't mean you want to stop working with them. Bingo. If you can save it. Yeah. But while they're in the business, I'm very clear that this is what we need to do. These are and objectives. if you can succeed at this, then these are the options that will open up for you. Mm. Um, and having that clear expectation setting conversation, you know, at first it's hard, but 
it's really the easiest conversation to have and it's the most important one to have. What are you doing? I mean, international, I think we were just talking about, um, you know, uh, deploying a new office uh, in Dublin or Europe or like, what have you learned about, you know, kind of growing past North America and, and yeah. kind of scaling that up? So we've actually had a few like, shots. Is it a customer a poll? A few shots at it. Okay. Yeah. So, so one is... Um, there's a, there's a rule of thumb out there that Bessemer wrote in the original 10 laws of cloud, which was removed from the updated version. It's funny because it was called cloud. Now it's kind of, I guess, SaaS. SaaS. Yeah. 10 rules of SaaS. Yeah. Byron Sore refers to it as cloud, which... I like it as cloud. It it it's more encompassing. Yes. Yeah. It's more than just... Because cloud doesn't necessarily mean your subscription, subscription revenue and yeah, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Cloud is, cloud is a technology model. Yeah. SaaS is a business model, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so a couple of things we learned. One, um, their their rule of thumb was, you know, wait till you're about a million dollars in MRR. Before that, you probably don't know your motion well enough to truly have it be successful or apply the. Local and when you use the word motion, for those it, that have never heard it, it's really kind of the go to market. Yeah, go to yeah. market strategy cool. and the, the sales motion, the the motion yeah. that you use to develop pipeline. Yeah, it's essentially, like a it's playbook, just, right? It's a velocity. Yeah, it's how do you create throughput and velocity? Exactly, and so. We tried to force ourselves into EMEA through a number of different strategies. One, um, sales rep wanted to move to London, so we, we moved her there and, and said, go for it and see what you can do. Um, that didn't necessarily work the greatest, right? I think there was a multitude of reasons, but this is a very different culture to sell into, and Europe is very bifurcated mm. from a country to country perspective versus North America is this gigantic market that's very homogenous, right? If you're Canadian, you can't understand how to do transactional sales, sales into the U.S. Europe tends, tends to be very relationship-based still. So very different sales process. So that didn't work. Prior to that, you know, we had a person on the team um, who was uh, an Irish dual citizen and wanted to move back to Ireland. And so we said, hey, go to Ireland and, and set up shop yeah. and introduce them to the Canadian consulate and the IDA and, and, and basically got things rolling. The day he went from just a straight salary to a, a comp model, which reduced his base, Very but had well. a quota, he quit. And that same day, he also posted a, a picture of himself climbing Machu Picchu in Peru. So that didn't work yeah. either. The lesson there is if you want to do a new region, you got to go all in. And by going all in, it means hiring someone local that understands the market, that has experience in your landscape and has sales experience. Somebody who is senior, I think, but is also willing to roll up their sleeves and go out there and close some business and prove the model works in a different economy. Hmm. And then it, it is starts different. The buying process, the, the deck, the communication, the relate. I mean, it is, it's not as easy like, oh, we're winning over here. Let's just bingo. Yeah. yeah. And then what about like you, how or do you know when founder? you're ready? No. How do you think you should be present in that? Like, are you going to spend more time here? Like, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause like so I've, somebody else argued recently, they were like the founder needs to, to essentially the founders really again, good at starting. So they go yeah. in, they they're there though. They bring that person, they work with them, they build the thing, they backfill. And maybe I think it they, depends what you're trying to do. If you're trying to yeah. build um, like a true secondary office that has development resources, et cetera, yeah, I think like that's, a full stack. that's the case. But yeah. From a sales perspective, like if we're doing it here, it's because we're running an inside sales team. Yeah. And for me to be present means me being on calls. Yeah. It also means my sales leader being on you calls, right? You can do that right? from wherever. And what we're finding is we have momentum in market. We're already closing about 10 to 15% of new ARR per quarter mm -hmm. in EMEA. Yeah. And we're not doing anything to market here. And what was the 10, what was the rule, I guess, for when you should do it? A million dollars in MRR, which, okay. which we are, yeah, yeah, we are sure. well, well, well beyond. Um, so we're kind of doing it late, but this, this pull and this momentum is yeah. there. And so now we're saying, okay, we have an amazing partnership with Marketo Adobe and that mm -hmm. they're a reseller. Yeah. So they'll sell us on their paper. talk. Talk about this one. Cause this one's interesting. This so, one's really exciting. Yeah. So what can you share about those details? I don't yeah, want to get so, you in trouble. So no, no, no. I like yeah, the splits I, and stuff. Cause I find it fascinating. Oh, the revenue splits. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so basically um, we were the number one Marketo launch point partner in terms of shared installs. Mm -hmm. And what we found early on was that the people using Marketo wanted to use video and they wanted to use a video platform that integrated into Marketo as in into the data set so they could do nurture programs based on video views and easily integrate video and email campaigns. Yeah, like if somebody watched two thirds of a video, go do this campaign. If they only yeah. watched 10 seconds, go do this. So we had hundreds of, hundreds of shared customers. 
Adobe comes along, buys Marketo to start winning mid-market marketing strategy. Yeah. And Marketo says, hey, Vidyard's a great, a great company. We want to start selling them on our paper to deepen the relationship with customers, make them more sticky, and build a, a strong technology ecosystem around what they call the system of record. And and for, for some companies like Adobe's got two eight hundred salespeople. Marketo, Marketo Marketo has six hundred. Yeah. Adobe would have thousands. But I mean essentially like you go to Marketo, they have six hundred salespeople. You guys have eighty or whatever. Yeah. And like all of a sudden now you can increase you don't have to add to your CAC. You yeah. can essentially start saying, hey, let's work a, a reseller. Um, and we'll talk about the the economics for them. Uh, and they're doing it because they don't they may not have the pipeline of innovation. Like, and I'm not saying that's true for them, but that's the way people need to think about it is um, if we can add innovation to create a real solution, which shared install base is probably a really good place to look. I know Microsoft yep. did this for years. Yep. Um, and then that way they can essentially increase, you know, ARPU and all that stuff and, and, and just get better, you know, win rates. They can increase all that stuff. How do you do that successfully? Because like, you know, how do you get the mind share of these reps like how many people on your team do you have just managing partner training? Yeah, um, six. Right and now. they're and they're, are they just for the Marketo or any all the partners? That includes HubSpot. Yep, Marketo, and then we're adding to it for Salesforce. And how do they get time with those salespeople? Is it part of the agreement? Is it part of the bar and so stealing? There's, there's one piece of it that's part of the agreement. So. Uh, an agreement to allow us to come in and run certain enable session, enablement sessions, get meetings, get press releases, all that stuff that gets okay. negotiated up front, yeah, and like it's important. Yep. Yeah, some co-marketing juice, some dollars, la 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 la, and then it's just pure hustle. So we've got an individual on this particular partnership that travels around the world, gets in front of sales Are they managers, quota carrying gets in front in of offices. To, yep. Okay, so they essentially their quota is. Is aligned Their with quota is what ideally Marketo Adobe is ultimately going to sell. Now, this is the this is the first quarter for it okay. that we're currently in. However, um, for all intrinsic purposes, there are um, over a hundred active opportunities now through this relationship and the that we've generated in the past seven weeks. Wow! And so it looks like, assuming these come through and close, it's going to be yeah. a very productive relationship for us. Yeah, and then uh, ratio. I think it was 60, 40. Oh, in terms of the revenue split? Yeah. We, um, it's, and you can just not tell yeah, us. Yeah, it's dynamic. Yeah. You, you came up with a number there, yeah. which isn't entirely inaccurate. What you want to make sure, though, is that and over time. I didn't time, say which way it was either. Yeah, who knows, yeah, who right? Knows. What you want to make sure is that over time, you retain as much of the value of the customer as possible. Mm. Right? So, so year one can look a certain way, but year two, three, and four can be totally different. Yep. Yeah, I know uh, lead pages. I think they were used to do like forty percent um, in year one, and then they would go down to ten percent year two. I've seen some people do you know forty percent year one and nothing year two. Yep. So it can really depend because I mean, there's so many different aspects. Even like the investment of co-market. When I did Flowtown, we did thirteen partner integrations, and like the first one was you know pay us to do the integration. So that was cool. They paid yep. us engineering. But then I got smarter and it was like, okay, pay us to do the integration and uh, agree to a $50,000 marketing budget yep. and a blog post and a case study. And it like, yeah, so you can have a lot of fun with it. But the big idea that you saw, and that I'm assuming if, if this trends in the productivity levels you want, is to then go find other companies where you can deploy yep. this because then you don't have to overinvest in your sales team yep. and still build pipe. Yeah, and there's some model that you you develop internally that you look at your cost of sale or your your cost of goods sold. Yep. Um, you think about your margin, you think about your LTV to cash ratio, CAC, all yeah. this stuff, and you can build what that ratio of of revenue split should be. Mm. And then understanding what the what the motivation is of Adobe in this particular case, right? They're a very large organization doing billions of dollars in revenue. Um, new ARR is important to them, but more importantly is that they retain the customers that they have. Oh, so, so they could actually look at their data set and say, customers with a Vidyard integration retain at a higher rate. Yeah. It's in our interest to get this deployed. We have strong retention rates, right? Because now, would you show you, them that if you had it? Like, did you have that data in regards to their, their customer retention? Did you? So when we do these things yeah. and we sign mutual NDAs, what gets asked of us, we like to ask of the partner in return. Oh, right. That's a good way to look at it. Um, because it helps us understand motivations and it makes negotiating easier. And it makes that's a good way. When you ask of me, I feel like 
I might ask of you. And I think that's a good strategy for M&A as well, right? Yeah. If you're being acquired by anything that could potentially be competitive at some point in the future, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of these companies just go out on fishing expeditions and pump you for information, you know. I want some information. Yeah, yeah. What are it's you all under mutual NDA, yeah. um, which you know is what it is. It but is, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's really important to get that as well. Who are the founders that you you look at in the market today or companies? I mean, obviously Salesforce, Benioff, blah, blah, blah. But like <laughs> upcoming, I mean, yeah. in that blah, blah, blah yeah, category. Well, the blah, 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 yeah, the 120 billion market cap or whatever it is. Um, but, you know, maybe up and coming that you think are doing really smart things from a distribution point of view or product point of view maybe lesser known. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so really well known. Um, I love uh, Brian Halligan and Tough our spot. mesh. I think they yeah. culturally are very aligned the way we think about building business. Um, Do you I see really, the new push for distributed teams or remote teams? Uh, yeah. Mesh just did yeah. a talk and he said, like, for years I argued against it because, you know, I just felt like everybody's got to be in one spot. And then, you know, as Darmesh is a technical guy, he just asked himself, like, what's the probability is the A players are going to be within a 100-mile radius of our headquarters? Yeah. Low. All right. So if we want to hire the best people. And so, like, they flipped the whole thing now where they've got, yeah. like, virtual pods and The only thing I'd teams. say with that is it's also a scale thing, right? Because the, the volume of A's within a 50-kilometer uh, or 50-mile radius that you need when you're a 10 person company, it's yeah, probably it's plenty, there. right? Yeah. But when you have, I don't know, where would seven, they be 800 yeah. engineers yeah, or but we're, thousands, yeah. I don't know. Um, then all of a sudden, yeah, you want more That's A's, a real problem. have to reach out. So it may not be something you do at the beginning, it's something you can do at scale. Yeah, for sure. You guys are mostly in one office? Yes, especially engineering. Like, you know, Waterloo, I think is one of the best, if not the best place in the world the, to hire yeah. and retain. I mean, Amazon, Facebook all figured it out. Microsoft, yeah. Lots of people are there. They all recruit from there for that particular reason. So that's why we're there. Yeah. Um, So hopefully that that advantage retains for a long time. I mean, our cap, our population catchment area, if you include the GTA, is like eight million people. Yeah. Um, So it's a lot larger than I think a lot of people People assume. And we've got people commuting from all over the place into the office now, right? Commuting from Toronto to Waterloo is a lot better than commuting from Waterloo to Toronto. Yeah, you're going against their against traffic. Yeah. 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 So culture, HubSpot. Yeah. So culture, long term thinking, uh, customer advocacy, obsession, HubSpot. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lesser known founders doing really cool things. Uh, There's a a gentleman named Martin Bissari. who is a co-founder with two of his brothers, a really interesting company based in Waterloo called Apply Board. Mm-hmm. And what Apply Board is doing is helping international students apply to North American schools. Sounds trivial, you sound like you can just go through a process, but what they do is streamline the application process so that it comes through their their technology and goes out to a bunch of different schools. Like pre-vetted or packaged in a way that the schools like? Yeah. And it's getting to the point where they have such a volume of international students coming in, which is where you know post-academic institutions make the vast majority of their of their profit because the the, the fees higher. are much higher, tuitions are much higher, are coming to them and saying, uh, "What should we teach to attract more students to our academic institution?" Mm. And their act one, in my opinion, is is helping this happen. And the universities pay them a very strong position on on, on tuition to do this. Yeah. Act two is these international students need bank accounts, they need lines of credit. So they created some valuable tools for the students looking, and, and for they're the taking a big on the. I mean, it's a marketplace for international yeah. students, and that's a big dollar amount. I mean, tuition's a big number. Yeah, take a piece of that. And now, you know, banks can't really figure out how to underwrite. Let's say a student comes from Pakistan. Yeah. You know, how do you underwrite a loan against family wealth or assets or whatever, Mm -hmm. right? And so they now have an opportunity to broker that transaction as well. And their second act is that is going to be... I mean, once you get into that, the vertical... Yeah, I mean, and the the third largest export in North America is education. Mm. So not only is it, you know, this amazing tool, it's a huge market, right? And very few other people are doing that one. So that one's cool. On the market, just disrupting a kind of pretty generic, like archaic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then another one, you know, I have to make a plug for her because I love her to pieces is my wife who you've met. Donna. Um, who's just She's an operational a, uh, monster. And, it's and impressive. In a good way and is such a strong advisor to me and a lot of the stuff I'm going through and, and experiencing as an operator. I mean, she's been through an acquisition. She was at NetSuite. She led product for the human capital management. 
uh, group, which uh, was a product that ended up calling being called Sweet People, which I think is a cool name for yeah. it. And then they got acquired by Oracle. She left and has now started a company called Kite. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on. I could keep raving about awesome yeah. people. Waterloo is is full of them. You gotta, we gotta get you there. And again, and last time up. I was there, man, you guys packed my. Remember that day? Yeah. You and Michael, Michael Macaulay. Yeah, probably. it just like packed. Like, go do a talk here, round table there. That bar is doing a talk at a bar that night. I mean, yeah. I pretty much showed up from seven a.m. till nine p.m. and then it was like some black car back to Toronto. Yeah, have you met um, Michelle? Michelle from, uh, from, Clearbank. No, uh, we've emailed. Uh, what's his name? Andrew. Andrew D'Souza. Andrew and I know each other. Haven't met with Michelle. Emailed them not too long ago, um, and we couldn't, you know, meet up. That's an Toronto. amazing. So that's just. Are last they in Waterloo one. or Toronto? They're Toronto. Yeah. Um, Andrew's a Waterloo guy. Waterloo grad from yeah. Systems. Same problem as me. Um, they're a couple. Yeah. Building an awesome company that's completely disrupting startup finance. Yeah. So RBF um, for e-commerce for the most part, revenue-based yeah. financing. Yeah. It's cool. It's really cool. Dude, this whole, like, um, I was ta- talking to Nathan Latka cause you know, he, you know, he's in the financing space and it's just neat how there's just more options, non-dilutive capital. Um, venture doesn't have a fit for every company. No, it's like somebody, I like the analogy of like pouring rocket fuel in a Jetta. If you're a Jetta, man, yeah, it's dangerous. And you know what? That Jetta Volkswagen. Yeah. Whatever. You know, yeah. I mean that I had a I had a Jetta. It Dude, my first car. Jetta. Yeah. An eighty seven diesel. Took it's my me first all the way to California and back, right? Yeah. And the reality is is you can cover a lot of distance in a Jetta. Yeah. Um There's and wrong with uh, it. and I think over time you can create a lot of value as well. Right, because you're not paying for that. You know, repairs are cheaper than it is in the front. Yeah, can, yeah the just getting a mechanic to work on it is way different. It's emotional anxiety. Yep. Um, I mean, looking back over the last decade of building companies and I, you've been, you've been pretty much entrepreneur and like even before you had, didn't you have a video production company before yeah, Vidyard? Yeah, Redwoods and, Media Video Production Company. Then I ran yeah. a, um, a semiconductor blog, which I sold. Yeah, and, and your uh, brother's an entrepreneur. I mean, this is yeah. just what you do. You create. Looking back over your time at Vidyard and really over the years, who have you had to become to be the person sitting here leading this company? Wow. That's deep. Who have I had to become? Not that we're finished in any means, like on a journey point of view, but like just what are some of those perspectives, beliefs that had to shift for you to, to continue? Yeah. Leading? I think uh, I have had to change a lot in the process. And in some ways I have, I have reflected that I've, I've lost a little bit of who I was and that person I liked. Um, I never was someone with, with like an edge or like, um, someone who could be irritable or someone who looked at a person, um, as a resource other than a human being. And I think one of the aspects of becoming a CEO and not just being a founder is that you have to make really hard decisions that force you into those positions. And those hard decisions you wear, like you brought up the example of the individual I had to terminate for being a bad values fit. I had to think about that person as a resource that was potentially going to fuck up my company and my dream and in the process do so for a bunch of people that I loved and respected that were around the table as well. And when you have to make those decisions and you battle with them and it challenges your personal sense of values, that's when I think you really and truly grow. But it's important to be able to retain who you were before that because that's the person that people love being with and love spending time with. And so that's how I think I can be jovial and very light about things. But also when it comes down to it, I am very serious and structured in my approach. And again, it's that transition from being a founder to a CEO. And you got to surround yourself with people that can help you do that, which is why I do the bald face trip, right? It's a vacation, but it's also getting exposed to a bunch of people in similar situations that are empathetic to the challenges you have and help normalize some of those challenges and some of the reactions and things you need to do in response to those challenges. Mm. So the process of changing is, is ever present. Um, I think for me, 
it's ensuring that I'm able to always come back to who I am. And Donna is also a very, very good at, Anchor. at anchoring me and leveling me. We, we ended up um, just in April, we, we bought a, a property on Lake Huron, but an hour and a half from where we live. And I go out there and I, I cut down trees and, you know, I ride this ATV through the bush and, and um, do some surfing and, and skimboarding and stuff that I love. And it has nothing to do with the context of work, but it recharges me. And when I'm going through those uncomfortable moments, I have this thing that I think about and reflect on. And I know is this representation of who I, who I truly am. But these are the things I need to do with my responsibility as it adheres to our stakeholders, right? Which is our customers, our team, our community, and our, and our shareholders. And I think, again, back to this transition of being a founder to CEO, all of a sudden you're responsible for so much more than you had ever imagined. And you need to be representative of those stakeholders in everything you do professionally. But again, not lose who you are at home. Dude. Awesome. Appreciate you, man. Grateful for our friendship. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Mike. Cheers, man. Cheers. Thanks for watching this episode of Escape Velocity. Be sure to like and subscribe and leave a comment with your biggest insight from our conversation. Be sure to check out the next episode.